Welcome everyone to the uh, February Reprenim webinar. We're super pleased to have Stefan Bowman today. Uh, Stefan has a master's degree in biomedical engineering. He has a PhD in multimodal imaging, uh, and he's currently at the School of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering at the University of Queensland in Australia. He will be speaking today about Neurodesk, an accessible, flexible, and portable data analysis environment for reproducible imaging. Uh, but without further ado, Stefan. Cool. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And I'll try to be at the live broadcast tomorrow morning as well. So that's then for me, 5 a.m. in the morning. So, but I will try to make that. Uh, so before I would uh, start, I would like to acknowledge a uh, country. That's what we do in Australia. So we acknowledge the land on which we're situated on. For us, uh, these are the Turabul and the Jagara people where the University of Queensland campus is on. And we pay our respect to the ancestors and elders. Um, I, another declaration of uh, potential conflict of interest I would like to, like to make because there are two uh, companies that I work with. So Oracle for Research, uh, Oracle Cloud, uh, that's one company. They partially fund the Neurodesk project via cloud credits. So that's they enable us to do a lot of the things that you will see today uh, and how we can run these free resources on the web. Um, and then I also receive research funding from Siemens Health and Ears, but it's not related to anything I talk about today. So I would like to ask with a quick question and uh, it's just, well, do we actually need an accessible, flexible and portable environment for reproducible neuroimaging, right? So why? Um, and I would like to answer this a little bit from, from my point of view. And I hope you agree with some of the problems I show. So the first one is the accessibility problem. Um, you know, our neuroimaging tools, they require Linux most of the time, which is really good. But the problem is, well, first, not everyone has access to Linux. So some people, some researchers have to run Windows because of their IT, they don't support Linux. Um, and then even if they get started with Linux, um, they run into the problem that our tools are very often not available in standard package systems. So if they just set up a normal system and they try to install, for example, Mink, um, that doesn't work. It's not there. Um, there is, of course, NeuroDebian um, that we all know and love. And if you are on a Debian system, you are a lot more luckier because then you can actually install free software and FSL from a packaged repository. And it works really well. Uh, on CentOS-based uh, systems, it's a little bit harder. There is uh, Neuro Fedora, but it doesn't have a lot of packages. So it, um, it is difficult. Let's say you run on a high-performance computing system. They often run CentOS-based systems, but you're not allowed to install packages. So you're not installed to run a, um, a YUM package there. Um, so very often then, the HPC admins, they make their life very easy, right? They just say, well, just go and compile it from source. It's trivial, right? And whoever has done that themselves knows it's actually not that trivial. So this is, for example, one build instruction that I had to write for myself uh, for Mink. Um, on our cluster where it's really like, okay, well, you have to go in there and you have to change the make files because stuff just doesn't work. The, the, the dependencies are just not there on sometimes an older cluster. So although it, it seems to be easy, very often it's not. And even although I've done this a few times, it often takes me a couple of days to get software to run on our high performance computing systems. And that really frustrated me a couple of years ago. So we started developing tools to, to deal with this problem. And all these tools together is what Neurodesk became. So um, that's, that's the first problem I faced. So the second problem is the flexibility problem. So and we have dependencies that our softwares need. So FreeSurfer needs FreeView here in this case, needs libpng 12.so.0. Uh, the problem is, when we update our operating system, sometimes these dependencies just disappear magically because Ubuntu decides to deep deprecate libpng12. And this actually happened to me as well. So then you can't run your old Freeview anymore and you need to upgrade or you need to, you, you need to keep your operating system as it is. So that's really uh, frustrating. Um, and yeah, and it's really, if you want to just, just keep doing your work, right? You're, you're spending a lot of time on maintaining things that you shouldn't spend time on. Um, and then the other problem is that because of, of, of all of this, we can't really take our tools. We can't just easily take them to a different platform. So for example, if I want to take uh, the same tool, like let's say I want to install AFNI on my notebook, on my lab workstation, on a cloud provider, on the university's high performance cluster, that takes days. And I think this is really unnecessary. And it's, it's quite a mess when you, when you look at it, because the cool thing is we have this wide diverse ecosystem of software, which is amazing because you can really find a software for everything you need, but then 
installing it and getting it to the computer is really, really hard. And what I often see in labs is that people have a, a workstation, they don't change over years, they just keep Ubuntu 16.04 on it. Um, and then they isolate it behind a firewall because it's really not a good idea to run such an old system, but at least everything works, right? And this is, I think, not a really great, um, a great situation um, because also it means that we're not using resources um, well. So let's say we we maybe we're wasting cloud resources because we keep the cloud machine running because it's it's so hard to set up, or maybe we're not using our university cluster as much as we should because it's just too hard to get the software on there and the HPC admins often don't have time to compile our software for us. Um, and then there is a problem that we're all aware of, the reproducibility problem, and um, I don't have to probably uh, name this paper to a lot of people, you, I think everyone is familiar with it, so Tristan uh, Klatar showed nicely that basically the dependency of the software, uh, glibc in this case, when you change the version from 2.5 to 2.18, you get different floating point results. And that leads to only small changes after a couple of digits. So it's it's actually, it looks like a small effect, but then the problem is we have these long pipelines and they these errors accumulate and they actually lead to significant differences in the end. Um, so that's not fun. So that also means that, let's say your glibc updates on your operating system, it means you could get different results the next day without you even noticing. Um, and that's not good. So. That's pretty much the, the problem state that we started on. And the question that we asked us is, how can we build a data analysis platform that solves these problems by using first existing technology and projects? Because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we started with a very small team. We started at the Brain Hack 2020. So we, we didn't have a lot of resources. So we said, OK, what's out there? Well, there is, there's NeuroDebian, which gives us packages. There's ReproNim, which, for example, has the NeuroDocker project, which already takes recipes and builds Docker containers. Uh, obviously, there is Docker, which could enable us to, to quickly package applications and ship them to different systems. Then there is Singularity, which allows us to do the same thing uh, on, for example, a high-performance computing system. Uh, of course, these days, we also have Aptainer, which is now the open source uh, or the, uh, the, the more open source version of Singularity, I, I would say. And um, then there is Conda, which, for example, allows us to ship Python packages. So we, sh we shouldn't reinvent anything there because these tools exist. So let's see what we can we do with this um, that, that brings us to a solution. So. And before I start and show what we did, I want to acknowledge that by now the project has grown quite a bit over the last three years. So these are our current contributors that helped us with debugging things, contributing code, um, helping us getting funding. So the project is currently funded by the Australia Research Data Council. Uh, our funding ends at the end of this year. Uh, Oracle for Research is funding the project um, massively with, with cloud credits. Um, Nectar is our Australian um, cloud provider where we for for researchers we can basically use a cloud provider for free and uh, the, this research cloud we we run a lot of um, a lot of uh, important infrastructure on that cloud provider and also Google Summer of Code for example supported the project um, by sponsoring a student that actually worked on the project and the National Imaging Facility is um, a big organization in Australia that looks after imaging assets and they also contribute in kind contribution of developers to the project. So yeah, we have grown quite a bit. You see, I, I had to turn the map uh, on focus to Australia because that's where most people currently are. We have a couple of people in the rest of the world, but we hope that um, with more exposure, we also get more people from the rest of the world that join the project. So now I thought I'll try something really risky. I try a live, live demo. So I just thought, let's start. I'll go to my browser. And the best way to get started with Neurodesk is to go to our website, neurodesk.org. So um, I'll just paste this in the chat as well, so you have it for later. Um, so now you see that we, we try to make this really easy to get started. So we have a quick start up here. What is Neurodesk? So if you want to read about it, uh, basically what I'm talking about in this, in this talk a little bit, you can read that here. But you can also just get started by clicking the play button. So what we did is uh, we basically host uh, Neurodesk on servers across the world. And the easiest way to get started is called Neurodesk Play. And here I just click a server close to me, Australia East. So you want something that's close to you um, just because we are running a desktop interface. And if you click something and that click needs 100 milliseconds to travel to the US and then back to you, that feels very slow. Uh, so here, if you run something that's local to you, you, you end up with uh, like a 20 milliseconds delay and it looks a lot nicer. So what we've done is we packaged Neurodesktop 
inside uh, Jupyter Hub. So we use a standard Jupyter Hub and we just run here a binder instance ourselves. And then here we modified and we added a button called Neuro Desktop. So what we can do is we click that button and now we get a full desktop interface running in the browser. So we use uh, Guacamole uh, to do that, which probably lots of people are also familiar with. And we use VNC or RDP as the technologies to, to get this desktop to you. And now we have a full desktop running in the browser. And you saw that I didn't have to do any authentication. So this is really a binder instance. When you're done, everything will be deleted. Now, so this is cool. Let's say you want to uh, just quickly test stuff, right? So what you can do now is uh, first question people ask me, well, how do I get my data there? Um, well, I'll show that here. Uh, you just drag and drop it from your computer. So I just had a, a folder open here on my Mac and I just drag and dropped it. And then you get a file transfer, which transfers that file to the cloud instance in this case. Uh, so while this is transferring, um, I quickly show we have an application menu to make this really easy. So there is a Neurodesk in there. And then when we go to all applications, you see that we have quite a few applications in there. Um, and I also just want to show that uh, when I look, for example, we also uh, categorize them. So you can just go all applications, you see everything. Or under visualization, let's uh, grab a really great tool for visualization um, purposes, MRI Crow GL. And then you see that, okay, uh, we can just visualize things, but of course I can also visualize the file that I just drag and dropped here. And now this is a, a, an MP2 rage from our seven Tesla scanner. Okay, so now what, what can I do with this? Well, everything. <laughs> so let me just show you one quick example. So I'll increase this a little bit, but I will not show a lot in these terminals. Um, but I thought it's, it's good to see um, just a little bit how it works. So basically, if you've used an HPC before, it will be it will feel quite familiar. So we use the module system, module load. So with module avail, you get a list of all the packages that we build, and uh, we we put them in, in different categories so visualization and structural imaging. So what you can then do is you can, for example, load FSL. And I just want to show one thing first. So let's say I want to do a brain extraction of this scan. So I go with my desktop. And here's my file. And then when I ask bet, it says, well, bet command not found, which is good because it's not installed. But I can do module load ML um, FSL slash six point. Let's use 6.04. It's a, it's a little slightly older version just to show that we can also run this. When we check with module load, we see now we got FSL 6.04. And now when I ask uh, where is bet, it tells me bet comes from the Neurodesk container repository um, and it's in FSL 604. And you also see a build date. So you can really be 100% sure this is the container I'm using. And then in there is bet. And then I can also just run bet and I get my, uh, my bet tool. And now of course, just to show that it actually runs, I take this scan and I call that bet uh, desktop. Uh, and I'll just use the dash V so you see that's actually doing something. Um, now it's running and uh, it's pretty quick. And now what I can do is I'll minimize my terminal again. And I can just show that it actually worked by drag and dropping it on my viewer. And now we have. Uh, not great brain extraction because it wasn't really tweaked. It was just the default settings. But um, yeah, this, this is how you could now use pretty much any tool that we got in here. And yeah, it would just work hopefully for you. So no installation. Um, and the cool thing is you see that you don't have to wait, right? You don't have to install FSL from a package repository. It takes hours to download because it, it's all just there. Um, and I will later show under the hood how this actually works, but we use a, a service called CVMFS, which is basically Netflix for software. You can think about it this way. So it streams software to the, to the data, to where it is. Um, so now I want to show another cool thing. So let's say, um, this desktop stuff, right? This is really cool. If you just want to quickly try stuff, but it's not really reproducible because I mean, you could write a script, but what you could also do, and lots of people love that, they love to use Jupyter Notebooks. So now I want to show something really cool. If I go in my Jupyter Notebook in desktop, I see that there's my bad desktop and my T1 file that I drag and dropped on here. Um, these things are connected. So now I could say, maybe could I run bet from a Jupyter Notebook? Um, well, let's try. So if I run bet here, it says, well, command not found. Okay, fair enough. What we did is we build a module system in Jupyter Hub as well. So what you can do is interactively, you could say, I want FSL, I want FSL 604. 
And then I have to restart the kernel because it modifies uh, the environment of the notebook. But once I restarted the kernel, bet is actually there, which is really cool. And when I check which bet, I see, oh, it's exactly the same bet that I just used on the desktop. And now I can run bet from here um, and say bet t1 and then bet Jupiter and then let's see. And then um, the live demo gods. <laughs> um, yes, exactly. Live demo gods, exactly. Because I started the notebook uh, outside the desktop. So what I need to do is uh, desktop T1 and then T1 uh, desktop and then bet Jupiter. Okay, wonderful. I promise something will go wrong because I will forget something. But now you see that bet is running in my Jupyter notebook. And now the cool thing is this is documenting right away what I'm doing. So I could then later share that notebook with someone. And then of course, I can also go back to my desktop and I can look at bet Jupyter, right? So I could now write a visualization function in Jupyter, but I could also quickly go to my desktop and just quickly check, well, did it actually work? And luckily I get the same result as before, but yeah. So that's just for quick visualization. The desktop is really nice. And, um, and of course, you can also do rendering. Uh, it uses software rendering, uh, but it should still work. I actually haven't tested that for that demo. I just thought I'd quickly try. Yeah, so it actually works. Um, and then uh, there we have a software rendered uh, brain, which uh, works. So now the crit is, uh, you could now say, well, this is not really reproducible either, right? Because I manually loaded FSL. I don't know which version of FSL I used. Well, I hear you. Uh, we did something there as well to fix that. So I unloaded the module. I will close these notebooks and I'll start a new one. So I'll go to desktop here as well. And what we've done is we built in LMOD into Jupyter as well. So we can do import LMOD in Python. And now what we can do is we can do a wait. Um, LMOD dot load, and then we can say, give us FSL 604. And now we can check, did that actually work? There it is. Uh, and now we have reproducibly loaded FSL and we use the tool bet. Now, the cool thing is that we can now combine different tools, right? So we could now say, uh, okay, well, I want FreeSurfer as well. And you don't even have to specify um, the, um, the version exactly. So you can just say, give me free server and it will automatically give you the latest version. But of course, um, if you do list, then you see you got uh, 732. So obviously it's always better to be explicit and then implicit. Um, good, now I can also show there's for example, Freeview and I could run uh, free view of well, uh, free view wouldn't make a lot of sense now in a Jupyter notebook, but uh, at least just to show, hey, I can do that, um, and it it didn't work before, and I can also then unload things. But now with this mechanism, you can 100% document which tool you used and which version you used, and you can just get your stuff done. It's really easy. And then the cool thing is that this notebook you can save, you can give it to someone else and they can run it in their Neurodesk instance on their computer with Neurodesk, and it will run exactly the same, will perform exactly the same. Okay, so this is, um, this is the first part of the demo I wanted to do. I quickly checked that I showed everything I wanted to show. Um, one quick thing, uh, of course, uh, we, we have a couple of examples in here. So if you go example notebooks, and we also have an example with NiPipe, uh, because I see a couple of NiPipe um, lovers here as well. So uh, there, of course, uh, it uh, you just load your FNI, you load your FSL. And that's the, that's the NiPipe was the main reason why we did it like this. So we can use NiPipe without modifying it. We don't need any container wrappers or anything fancy there, it just works because we're using native system calls that then gets translated into the container um, into the container engines. Uh, and we basically abstracted all the fact that it's running in a container. And then a, a normal NiPy pipeline would run. Um, yes, and I can quickly show just how this works. 
because I think now is a good point. So if uh, we see, if we quickly do this again, which bet? So you see, it looks like there's this binary, uh, but the way it works is that this is actually a wrapper script that then calls into singularity. Uh, so we say singularity, we, we hide all errors, um, and then we just exec in a current directory uh, a certain container, and then we pass this bet in there, and then we pass all command lines. So that's the whole trick, and that just allows us to be very easy, and people can just use their bash script as, as what they're used to, but under the hood, they're all using containers, but they don't need to understand singularity, or they don't need to understand Aptainer. It's just, it's just done for them, and we handle all the data um, management around it. Okay, so this is um, play, uh, the play version. So now let's say you don't want to play, you want to work a little bit. Uh, we, we can do this as well. So when you go to Neurodesk and you click on play again, we have another version, which we call Neurodesk Lab. And Neurodesk Lab is the same as Neurodesk Play, but with one exception, it uses an authentication layer on top. So we use GitHub. So if you authenticate with GitHub, it starts... Uh, a Jupyter Hub as well. Uh, it's not using Binder anymore. So now we can actually do stuff like user management. We can keep your data. Uh, we can give you GPUs. We can give you a lot of uh, storage because now we have an authentication layer around it. So it's it's a lot less risk for exploitation um, because we know who is there. Um, and then we get exactly the same thing. And it performs exactly identical, just that it keeps your session stored. So you can actually work and you can store your data there and everything persists across sessions. Um, so for workshops, this is really cool um, because then people can go on a break and their, their files just stay there. But otherwise, exactly the same thing. I just quickly wanted to show that because that's a question I often get. Uh, this play is awesome, but I would like to keep my data. And yeah, we we have that option, but we don't say this is the first option because then people need an authentication. Okay, so next thing. Um, the next thing is, let's say you want to use Neurodesk on Google Colab. Well, you can do that too. Um, and what we have to do is we have to do a couple of uh, little setup commands. Um, and I'll show this I'll show this in a new Google Colab. So you see it's actually not a lot and it doesn't take a long time. So I'll take a new notebook and um, there it is. And now I copy my setup commands in there. And what this does is, um, well, it, it sets up things for the obtainer or the singularity that we need. Uh, it sets up our LMOD, it sets the module paths. And then in this Google Colab setup script, we install things like singularity into Google Colab. Uh, we install our CVMFS client that then connects to our servers that stream the software to you. Um, and we do a couple of other setup things that we need for this to work. Um, once this is working, uh, so this will just take hopefully a few seconds. Then we can use, again, exactly the same mechanism that I showed in Jupyter Hub. Um, and we can use, we can import LMOD, we can ask what's actually there in terms of available packages, and then we can just load the package that we need. And then we can run, um, we can run bet in Colab without downloading it, because that was a problem that I faced myself. I wanted to use these tools in Colab, but then you can't install FSL in Colab because it, you don't have enough storage. Um, and also it takes too long. So the, the notebook times out before you have installed it. So that's that's a bit frustrating. And um, and also it takes a long time. So I wanted to do this, to have this very quick. Um, so the, the, the longest thing uh, here is the setup, but then once it's set up, and I already copy these next commands there, so I can quickly show that. Um, here we are. And then I'll just show that that actually works. Um, Good. Let's hope if the, of, uh, if the demo gods are with me. Uh, Google can sometimes also just decide to do interesting things, but it looks good. Um, and I can just execute that already. <clears throat> While you're waiting on the um, uh, demo gods, can I ask, interrupt for a quick question? Definitely, yes. LMOD is a functionality I've not run into, uh, so I just was curious if you can say a little bit for the novices what LMOD is doing for you. 
Yeah, definitely. Oh, good, good point. Yes. So LMOD, people are familiar with LMOD if they use high performance computing systems. What LMOD does is um, it, I'll show that interactively in our Asia Pacific instance. Um, I'll just grab a terminal here. So what LMOD does is it comes with a couple of commands. Uh, the, the first one is module avail. Module avail lists packages that are prepared for LMOD. And then how do these packages look like? Um, I quickly showed it. So um, they are, they're actually, they're quite simple. So in, in a nutshell, LMOD modifies your path variable very simply. So if I do echo path, I think I can probably show that. So this is now my path. If I ask bet, bet is not there. If I say modulate FSL and I say bet, bet is now here. If I now echo my path again, you see, and I'll just make that larger. So um, you now see that the only thing this module load command did, it added CVMFS Neurodesk containers FSL in front of my path. And that's why bet is now available. I can also do module unload FSL. And if I do echo path again, it is removed. So. LMOD is a very clever way of modifying your paths live without having to do export path, remove stuff, delete stuff. Um, and you can you can nicely, and, and it's a list, and then it just lists of, okay, what are all the modules I have available? So uh, basically these module files we store in CVMFS, Neurodesk, containers, and um, I believe it's actually modules. Uh, Neurodesk modules. Yes. So here it is. So in there we have these categories. So now when we go structural imaging, uh, you see here, then we have FSL there, and then FSL has different versions. And then I quickly show just, just for the curious minds what this looks like. Um, FSL, and then just grab 604. And then you see here, it's it's actually really at that simple. It's prepend path, and then it prepends the path. That's that's all. And with yeah, so I hope that's um, that's helpful. And then in Python, uh, so there's a Python module as well. It does the same thing, but it modifies the OS environment variable within your Python session. So you don't have to do that manually. Which basically it does um, it does this stuff. What I did up here, um, it does this, and then it works. I'm just thinking I could actually do this stuff within module load as well. I need to think about that. Um, but now uh, the demo gods are with me. So it installed everything. And now I've import LMOD and await LMOD avail. And that just shows me what are all the packages I could load. And then here is my bet. And now I can run bet in Colab without installing anything. But yeah, I could run anything. But that's just the, the point there. Okay, so now the next thing I want to show is, let's say you use clinical imaging data and you don't want this stuff on the cloud. You want to have this quite securely, internally, uh, behind your firewall. Your university doesn't allow you to upload this anywhere, which is really fair to say. If you don't work with open data, that's a really good reason not to put the data on the cloud. And you can run this stuff all internally as well. And I quickly want to show how this works. So. Uh, what I've done here, so you can run it on Mac, Windows, and Linux as well. Um, the only problem is that I have a Mac M1 notebook and it doesn't support M1 yet. And that's something that's on our roadmap where we would love to have some funding to do this. And uh, we're looking uh, to, well, we're working on this with, with Chris Rawdon and a couple of other people, but it will still take a bit of time. So M1 is coming, but of course um, I can't show it on my own notebook, but what I did is I prepared uh, a remote machine. Um, and I'm just connecting to it. And the only thing that's important to know is I need to use a port forwarding. So I'm forwarding port 8080 uh, from this remote machine to my local machine. And then this uh, machine is in my lab. So it's just a server in my lab um, that's, that's there and I can just connect there. The reason why I want to use a port forwarding is you don't want to open that port on the network because then everyone could then access your Neurodesk instance that runs on that server. But by, by, by securing it with an SSH tunnel, it's, it's secure. And we describe in the documentation how to do this. So um, once you've done that, you are now on a Linux machine and then 
I'll show the setup as well. So when you go and click on Linux, you see you need to install Docker, you need to install Neuro Desktop, and then you just need to copy this command and you paste this command. And then this runs Docker, it downloads the desktop, it starts the desktop interface, it uh, mounts our software repository that's remote, which it just did, and here it is. And now it gives you an address, localhost 8080. And now you can take this address and you can open that in your browser. And now I'm on in my lab behind my firewall. And now here I have Neurodesk running and here I have my storage. I can connect all my data and then it works identically to what I had on the cloud. But of course it's running under my desk or it's running in a server room of my university, which then, um, uh, which then makes uh, which then makes people happy in terms of uh, IT. Now I just wanted to show that uh, the visualization also works quite nicely there. Uh, MRI for GL. I grabbed the wrong one, and then here we are. And then I'll just grab another file, load that, and uh, and of course it's a bit faster because everything is local and local disk and everything. So yeah, so that that you can do. Good. The last thing I want to show is, because um, I, I mentioned this in the introduction, that this was a big pain point for me, that I wanted to run these things on high-performance computing clusters. So I'll disconnect from my lab machine here, and I connect to um, an HPC. So our HPC is called Banya. So here it is. So I connect to Banya. Um, Banya is protected with uh, with dual factor authentication. So let's let's hope the demo gal gods are with me that this works because I logged in before the demo a few times. Um, ah, ah, no, sorry, I forgot to say yes. Give me the passcode. Okay. So it should just take a few seconds if it didn't time out. Uh, there's a question. Is that friendly sauna fans? I feel they're managing this one. Yeah. Uh, I don't understand quite a question, Yaroslav. Uh, can you? Ah, oh, that's cool. Oh, I did not. Yes, yes, of course. Yes, it makes sense. Yes, uh, um, yes. It, I'm, I'm sure it produces a lot of feed. I think our um, our GPU rack is actually water cooled. So. <laughs> um, yes. Okay. No, I. Uh, the demo gods are not with me. I uh, just try. I just. Uh, ah. Okay. I know why. Because I disabled my. Uh, I put my phone on flight mode just so I'm not disturbed during the talk. Obviously, the authentication can't, can't come through. Okay, wonderful. Demo gods are with me again. So now I'm on our HPC. And the first thing, of course, I'm on a head note of an HPC. Um, everyone, um, everyone knows that who knows it needs an HPC. You need first an, a, a job, an interactive job. So that's what I'm currently doing. It's a long command that completely irrelevant. Uh, it just gave me an interactive job so I can actually show stuff. And now, I quickly want to show that I prepared repronym demo here. So there is a file. And I just want to show that bat is not available on my HPC. I haven't installed it. I haven't compiled it. But I installed Neurodesk. So what I can do now is I can use a command called module use. And I basically say to the module system of my HPC, get me the modules of Neurodesk. And it's doing this now. And now I can use module load FSL. And now it will give me FSL 604 in this case. And now I have bet. And there it is. And it's coming from my neuro command local containers and it's running in a container on, on the system. And now I can also just to demonstrate that it actually works, bet HPC. And then there it is. And of course it's an HPC, so it should be pretty fast. Um, and there it is and it's running. And it's all running in a, in a container uh, as well. So I'm, I'm not dependent on the underlying system. And now there is my bad HPC that I just ran. And it works. And you can get all the containers downloaded onto your HPC. 
and then they also stay there. So when we, we, we can theoretically stream the software to your HPC as well, but HPC admins hate that. Uh, they hate if stuff comes in that they can't control, so they will block the ports usually. So that's why we have a, a mode where the, the containers are downloaded to your system and then they're just, they're just there and they stay, which is also nice for reproducibility. Okay, this is everything I wanted to show interactively. So now I have uh, about 10 minutes left to show to explain how everything works and the uh, reproducibility aspects. But are there any questions? So there's one question, uh, singularity containers. Yes, there are singularity containers. Uh, we sometimes use Aptainer, we sometimes use singularity. They are in the end unpacked in a flat file system. So they're like more CH root environments. Um, and then, yeah. So Lisa asked, what if Neurodesk isn't installed on HPC? Uh, do we only need to download a container on the HPC? So yes, that's a cool thing, exactly. So you don't need to ask your admins really. The only thing you need is Singularity or Aptainer on your HPC. And then you can just follow the instructions on the website uh, to install it on your HPC. So when you click, uh, I want to run it on the HPC, you get to the HPC instructions and then we say how this, how this works. Um, and then, yeah, try it out. If you if you if you run into problems on your HPC, we're, we're happy to help. But every HPC is slightly different, so we just tried a very generic way of describing how it would work. But theoretically, every HPC should be able to do it, um, even if if Aptainer or something is not installed with a new versions of HPC of operating systems. You can actually run this in user space, so you really don't need to ask the admin anything. You could just do this completely on your own in your home directory with minimal privilege. So it's actually all quite quite secure and quite nice. But yeah, happy to help there if you run into problems uh, with your HPC. And I'm also keen to collect more examples for HPC installs. Okay, so that looks like all questions for now. I return to the slides and now I quickly need to skip all my backup slides that I didn't need, which is fantastic. I really thought something wouldn't work, but hey, Good. Um, ah, yeah. One more question from Lisa. She asked if there's uh, a lot possible to create group access as well. Yes, of course. So what you can do is you install these containers in a in a in a location that multiple people on the cluster can see. So let's say you have a group share where you store your data, and then and then you can access it. And another question: Will it need CVIM as reaching outside of the HPC to fetch containers? So yes, we have two options there. You could run it with CVMFS, but uh, most HPCs don't allow that. And that's why we simply download the singularity containers on the HPC and we store the singularity containers there. So we avoid the, the, the CVMFS issues there. But yeah, it means that you need a couple of minutes to install it. Yes, so the next question, how does the container creation and publishing work? And that's what I'm explaining now in the slides. So I'm getting to this now. Um, so this is exactly what I want to talk about now. So how do we build this? How do we think this should work uh, long-term with the community and everything? So. For us, the center of this whole project is the community, the neuroengineering community. They contribute containers. Um, they basically build recipes, and I show this in a little bit more detail later. They contributed this to a, a container repository, which then stores it, and we make it accessible via various means. So it can then run on Linux, Mac OS, the cloud, Windows, HPC clusters, Jupyter notebooks, whatever you need. So we then manage all of that for you. But basically, there's a single point where these containers get into the pipeline, and then everything, the rest, it distributes these containers across the world to different systems. Um, oh yeah, and I wanted to talk about these things individually, so that's what I just did. Uh, community builds containers, and then they run everywhere. Good. So this is how it looks like uh, from a technical point of view. So we have GitHub Actions. So we have a build script that uses NeuroDocker, NeuroDocker Generate. Uh, we have a base image. And then if you're lucky, and for example, Mink is within NeuroDocker, you just need uh, the tool name version. And then we need a, a few little things for NeuroDesk to work, like this deploy path. Um, but the rest is all standard NeuroDocker. And then you contribute this build script. The build script gets automatically built on uh, build instances that we host on the Oracle Cloud because the normal uh, builders from GitHub are not large enough for our containers. So like FSL is a good example, FreeSurfer, they are all too large to build properly. Um, and we, we, we use on our own cloud resources to do this. So we have custom runners. Um, and then that gets all built, and then that all gets uh, uploaded to the Docker registry, to the GitHub registry, it gets converted to singularity containers, they get stored on object storage, they get stored on CVMFS, and, but basically this distribution pipeline is all automated and we, we get it out to the different endpoints. 
Um, I just quickly wanted to explain, just in case someone hasn't heard about a container, what a container is and why it's so useful, but I'll make it very brief. Basically, in our operating system, usually when we install things, it's all very tight. So everything is connected to dependencies, left, right, and bottom. So you need exactly the right dependency to work. That's why you see these errors like libpng is not there because if the, the, the software just was compiled against that and it needs it, basically. Um, so now the problem is if your operating system changes, so let's say you're upgrading Ubuntu 16.04 to 18.04, stuff will break. Uh, and that's now happening, so our dependencies are not there anymore. Um, and a container helps with this. So a container packs everything we need in there. So it has all the dependencies in there, um, all the libraries the software needs. It's completely self-sufficient. And it's the questions from Yaroslav there. Um, they are completely self-sufficient. They would also run without Neurodesk, correct. So you can use our containers and we have actually an instruction for that as well. So you can just go and say, I want to use, uh, pure containers, and then you get Docker containers, singularity containers, or you can use our containers on CVMFS. So you get our three entry points and you can directly use them however you like them. So I guess for, for data led, for example, the best point would be to use our singularity containers directly. Um, but yeah, so very, very good question. So exactly, so it contains all the software that's there. And then the cool thing is, um, Container engines like Docker, they are supported on, on all major operating systems right now. So we can run on Windows, Mac, and Linux because of that, because Docker did the hard work there and they, they have a virtual machine that then makes us and allows us to run these containers. But yeah, with this, we just have all these application systems and that gives us standardization, portability, reliability, and also reproducibility, which I will show at the end of the talk. So then I already showed this desktop. Um, just here again, a little bit under the hood. So these containers, they solve our dependency issues. So because everything is packaged in individual containers, which seems like a waste of, of, of space, but it actually allows us to, to package FSL in every version that's out there. And we don't rely on what's underneath an operating system. So that's how we can run on old HPCs, on new HPCs, on cloud computing, on whatever. Um, and also, uh, because people sometimes ask me, well, how much space does it need? It doesn't need much because we use a deduplication mechanism on CVMFS. So we unpack everything and everything that's double is not stored again, basically. So that's the, the simple answer that the space requirements right now is like 123 gigabytes. So it's, it's very, very small, um, and it, it can scale, uh, horizontally. So CVMFS is built for, for much, much bigger data sets. So we think this, this, this potentially scales to, to all tools we would ever need in the community. Um, good, then I mentioned CVMFS a few times and some people might be interested in it, but I'm also completely aware it might be totally uh, over the head for, for, for some. So I'll just quickly explain what it is. It's basically a web based file system. So, you know, you have your file systems on your computer, you can do the same thing via HTTP. So via your browser, you could talk to a file system and it's a read only file system that's run on the web. Um, and then we have a stratum zero server. That's basically the ground truth. That's where everything gets ingested. And then we have multiple mirror servers across the world. So here I just displayed three in the US, in the Europe and in Australia. And then this is all run, runs all on Oracle Cloud and is all sponsored by Oracle Cloud as well. And then the end client, so your laptop, your desktop, your HPC, they then figure out what's the closest server to me. They connect to that server, or if CVM is not possible, they download the packages from another source, uh, the containers from another source, so they're in your HPC. But uh, that's basically how it works. And then you just get all these uh, containers, and then you can just use them, which is really nice. Okay, uptake in the community. So, so far, as I said, we, we launched like three years ago, but the project wasn't usable like the first two years. Um, but I would say like in the last year, it became really usable. And then six months ago, we started tracking where people come from because funders were asking us, um, how many users do we actually have? And we said, mm -hmm, yeah, don't know. But so we started tracking a little bit. So now we know that in the last six months, we had about a thousand users from 47 countries. So there is quite an uptake. Um, our GitHub repos have quite a bit of stars and forks and lots of people are interacting with us there. And development is mainly driven by hackathons and by the grant that we got that now finances a lot of that. And I just see there's another question. Uh, what if you want to change or build a container? Can this be done in Neurodesk as well? This is a common problem in HPC, usually with Docker needing permissions. Yes, very good point, uh, Lisa there. So 
Um, building these containers is done completely automated on GitHub. So you can just tell us, here is your build script, uh, and we build that container for you on our infrastructure. But if you're building a new container, you need to try things, right? You need to install a library, you need to download something, you need to test it. And for this, we just built an interactive container builder at the last hackathon, BrainHack Global, in December. It's not yet quite polished, not quite finished yet, but uh, Tui, uh, she's actually in the meeting today, she's a PhD student in our group, she worked a lot in that, um, and I think very soon uh, you will be able to build containers on Neurodesk itself, test them there, make sure they work, and then once you're happy, you just uh, push them to us, we build them automatically, and we push them through the distribution pipeline, and then everyone has the container. So yeah, that's our ideal goal. Uh, so yeah, if, you're, if you want to test this, um, give us, uh, yeah. Get, a, get in touch and you can you can test this interactive builder. So we have one instance where we enabled this interactive building. But I thought I, I don't show it today because it just goes a little bit uh, too much too deep. So the last thing I quickly want to show, because I, pro I promised in the beginning that we're trying to solve this reproducibility problem. So is it actually reproducible? So I think that's probably the, the question that everyone is waiting for. So again, I, uh, I, I named Tui here uh, because she did all these analyses. So I'm just presenting her work here, um, but she basically took uh, Glata's paper and reproduced the unreproducibility. So the, the setup in the paper is they use FSL flirt to register to the MNI space and then first to segment subcortical regions. Um, and then we have uh, two systems, uh, one Intel i7, one AMD core, just to get a little bit of processor mix in there, because I think we'll see later that it's actually important. Um, but then Neurodesk basically keeps everything consistent on glib3.223, um, and the local system has different versions of glibc, which is good, makes sense. So we would expect, based on the Glatar paper, that there are differences between these two analyses that are run identically. So if you run them on the same system, they produce exactly the same result. But if you switch system, they suddenly produce slightly different results. So this is what we also found. Uh, so we really found that the registration, there is an image intensity difference in the whole brain here. We just focus on the thalamus because that's the area we later segment. Um, and you see the absolute difference is small. It's like 1.2. So it means like in a, a 0 to 4096 image, we are off by 1, right? So it, it's, it seems like a tiny effect, but it's there. Um, Neurodesk, however, doesn't have any of these differences. It's completely deterministic. There's no difference between the systems. Uh, there's just zero, absolutely no difference in the registration. Now, interesting thing is when we look at first, so first is the segmentation step. Again, with the local install between two different systems, we get quite a bit differences. So uh, this is a dice dissimilarity. Um, and yeah, we get segmentation differences uh, in these labels, which is not really what you want. In Neurodesk, we do get something which is really interesting, but you have to note that this is an order of magnitude smaller than what we see on the left. And we had to basically amplify it a lot to make it actually visible. And we believe this comes from the processor difference because we're using an Intel and we're using an AMD processor. They have slightly different instruction sets. And that is something we can't solve. We don't emulate hardware. We don't virtualize anything. We run on the hardware that's there. We use the instruction set that's there. So if there's a small difference in floating point um, processing, which there is between these two processes, you still get slight, slight differences. So the criticism would be it's not 100% reproducible, and it's probably not possible if you're not using the same processor. Um, that's that's at least our conclusion there. So this just shows the same thing in in, um, in tables. So that basically in Flirt, 100% reproducible for Neurodesk, local install, nah, not really, but the effect is small. So the, the effect is really small. Uh, you, you barely can see it with your eye that there's a difference. So you really need to have a lot of data to actually show that effect. And with FSL first, we see Neurodesk is not 100% reproducible, but 99.99999, so it's pretty close, and the difference comes most likely from the hardware. Um, and yeah, the local system, again, is, is a lot less reproducible. So. Okay, uh, then when we investigate, like, where are these differences coming from, uh, our hypothesis was that because of different glibc library versions, we get different system calls, and that's exactly what, what Tui found. So when she traced all calls of all libraries, we quickly diverge between systems. So very quickly, uh, the analyses do different things on different computers, whereas on Neurodesk, these two system calls are exactly the same across the whole runtime of the program, which is what you want to see. 
And that means, and that's that makes us quite confident to say that the little bit of difference we still see comes from the hardware because we can't control that because everything we can control, we controlled and there it's 100% reproducible. Okay, that brings us to uh, brings me to my very last point, which is uh, something I always wanted to see like interactive papers. And that's also where I said we are, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, but rather work with other projects. So we, con we contacted the Neural Libre team and asked, well, would you like to use, for example, our containers on your Neural Libre instances or also in eLife that could be done? So we are hoping that we can integrate with these platforms and then you could just run bet in your paper uh, accompanying notebook that then shows these analyses and reproduces these analyses. And for the paper that we currently um, developed for Neurodesk, we, we actually reproduce all the analyses about the reproducibility of Neurodesk on Neurodesk. So you can actually run the whole analysis of the paper inside Neurodesk. And yes, it will take a day, for example, for this registration of the hundreds of subjects, but um, you can also skip that step and you can reproduce all figures. So we really tried to eat our own uh, dog food and it's really tasty. So um, that brings me to, yeah, just saying we, we, we can integrate with these notebooks and we hope that these projects do that. And just one thing I wanted to show at the end is what does Neurodesk really do for you? You could install everything locally. You can keep doing that. That's, it's not a problem, but there is an effort. There is a price you pay when you switch from your personal laptop to your lab workstation to cloud computing and into high performance computing. So that means some people don't do it because it's just massive effort to get stuff running on the HPC. If you use Neurodesk, you can still do the same thing, but everything is a lot less effort because you get the same container on every system. You don't need to install it. Uh, you don't need to wait for a long time. You just get it. You can quickly shift your analysis between systems. Um, you know that you roughly get the same results. I mean, yes, if you run on different hardware, there's still hardware differences that we can't control, but at least the effort in shifting uh, things around is really, really minimized. And with this, you get basically, you clean up that mess that we had up here. Everything is not organized and it's really hard to install. Um, and then you clean it up nicely and it ends up on all of these platforms. Um, and there's one quick question from uh, JB. Uh, is glibc actually called from the container, not installed in the container? So glibc is installed inside the container. So FSL uses, in this case, glibc from within the container. And we are basically, we don't care what glibc version is outside the container. So it could be a really old version, could be a really uh, new version. And that's how the reproducibility uh, works. Yes. So that's that's the trace uh, experiment that, that I showed in the last slides. Um, I quickly want to show um, the roadmap, what we still want to do and where we need help from the community. So more neuroimaging containers, there's still stuff missing. So if you have something that's not there, contact us, help us to get it in there. Uh, we, of course, are very focused on the actual infrastructure. So we, we have very limited time to build new containers. But um, yes, so the more there is in, for example, NeuroDocker, the more we can easily port into. Um, we just finished the implementation of GPUs. Um, I quickly showed it as well. Um, and we're working on the ARM and M1 processors. Uh, we want to work on federated learning for segmentation, um, and we're also working on more JavaScript-like web assembly stuff, so we can hopefully one day get rid of Docker uh, and uh, get these things natively into the browser. That's that's something, uh, a long goal that we have. We'll see if we ever get there and how this will look like. I think we'll, we'll, we'll do something, but it might look slightly different than what Neurodesk is today. Um, yeah, with this, I want to end, and I can just quickly show on our test instance um, that's then how it will look like. So with GPUs, for example, you get a deep learning environment with GPUs and then it provisions uh, a GPU. And obviously someone is testing right now the GPUs. So the GPUs don't launch, but um, yes, that's what we're currently working on to get deep learning in there as well, because that's something that we do quite a bit. Um, and there's another question. Uh, can you tell us a bit more on the plan with NeuroLibre? Uh, yes, I can. So the, the plan is, I would just love that we can mount our CVMFS repository with containers on NeuroLibre instances. And I had a quick chat um, and we're currently just trialing what, what could be a way of doing this in a responsible way. So it's also there of long-term. I think that's probably the way, the, the biggest problem. I think technically it's very easy. It's just one line, but then how do we do it that it works uh, long-term? I think that's, I think the challenge that we need to solve there. So yes, if you have uh, insight there or questions that, that will be, we can talk offline about that. 
Um, another question is containers. Is there any type of metadata annotation describing the containers? E.g., what is application for what data, like ABC apps to do on Brave Labs? Unfortunately, yes, that's a very, very good point, uh, point Jaroslav. So we would love to have something like this. We would love to have a way of searching our containers. Currently, it's very... Uh, very sim, very easy. So here we just have applications. So you can just say FSL, and then you see FSL is functional machine, structural machine fusion. So it's it's very simple. We would love to have a repository where you can search them, where there's some metadata with them, and that's something we would love to do in the next project. Um, and yeah, and and really rethink how we how we describe these containers. I would love to have some help on that. Um, Exactly, exactly. And the same thing, can that container be used on a GPU, for example? Exactly. So it would be amazing to have um, a, 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 a repository where you can just say, I want a container with certain software versions, with certain GPU libraries, exactly. So we're, we're running into this issue that we have more containers than uh, we were thinking initially. So it's, it's becoming difficult to organize them. And we really want to do something there fundamentally to, to, to make them searchable, findable, and then also citable in the end. So they actually get a DOI. So you can say this container was used in that application. That's, that's all our roadmap, but just a lack of time so far. Uh, there is, and there's no unification of interfaces. Currently, we're just packaging the standard uh, apps. However, you could put a bits app in there or an ABC app or flywheel gear. So we actually uh, have a couple of our containers. We build flywheel gears from that. So you can use them as a base for that. Um, and also, yes, uh, JB, a boutique descriptor is something we had on our roadmap to do there. Um, it's just something we didn't get to it. And we, we really focus on getting the infrastructure done first, but it's something we really want to do in the next step. Like a boutique descriptor is definitely something that would be perfect, yes. So these containers can have a really nice interface. So the ballpark, as so it is a question, how much was the ballpark size of all containers we currently have? So currently, I would say it's like 300 gigabyte singularity containers. And then when we unpack them on CVMFS, it's about 123 gigabyte. So it's not, it's not crazy. Uh, but yeah, every, I mean, every free server build will, will bump that up by 10 gigabyte because it's quite large. 